Now, today is not going to be one of those just deep, deep, revelating words. It's going to be a wonderful word, but it's not going to be just one of those, wow, that was just so, my gosh, pastor has been in the presence of God. Well, I hope you'll say that anyway. This will be a powerful word, but it's not going to be no just deep, thought-out word. It's just a wonderful, powerful word from on high. How many of you know it doesn't really matter as long as it's from God? And I reassure you this is truly from God. Here's a question that I want to start out with asking you. If I were to tell you that there's a biblical principle that if applied to your life will transform it, your ministry, our church, and our city, would you believe me and would you join me in doing it? Would you join me if I told you that there's something we can find in the Bible that will transform your life, that will transform your ministry? How many of you know that we've all got a ministry? Yes. We, we've all, God has called all of us to ministry. So every person is, has an individual ministry, but we are collectively in the ministry. But it will transform your life, your ministry how about our church? Some of you know that we could use a transformation in the house. Yes. Well, what I'm going to share with you will transform our church and ultimately our city. Do you really believe that God can use us to transform our city, Amen. to change our city? If God could use 12, he could use, we got a lot more than 12 today. I believe God has the power to do it. But do you believe that he can do it? Amen. Let me ask that, a qu that again. Do you believe that he can do it? Yes. Do you want God to use you to do it? Yes. You, you really want God to use you to do it? Yes. I've, 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 I've been in the presence of God, and God has spoken to my heart clearly about what we need to do to make it happen. Amen. It's not a matter of if, but it's a matter of when, if we come on board. Yes. I'm on board. I'm on board. Let me read it again. If I were to tell you that there's a biblical principle that if applied to your life would transform your life, your ministry, a church, and our city, would you believe me? And would you join me in doing it? Now, here's what i got to tell you this, though. Before telling you what it is, I must first inform you about something pertaining to it. Before I tell you what it is, I've got to first warn you, in other words. Tap your neighbor and say, get ready for this. Now, we all want transformation in our personal lives, right? You, you want God to take your ministry to the next level, right? Well, even if you don't know what your ministry is, God has a ministry for you. So even if you don't know what it is, you should still desire that God take your ministry to the next level. It, God will use to transform our church. It. God will use to transform our city. But before I tell you what it is, I need to warn you about something pertaining to it. You guys ready? Yes. Let's tell them. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's going to cost you. Are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to pay whatever it is that's going to cost you to change your life? Is your life worth it? Yes. Is, is your church worth it? Yes. Is your ministry worth it? Yes. Is God's city worth it? Yes. Is God's people worth it? Yes. Now, it's going to cost you something. Are you willing to pay what it's, what it's going to cost? Are you willing to pay? You, some of you are probably thinking, well, I need to know what it is first. <laughs> Pastor, I'm going to pay the price, but first tell me what it is. It's no more than what God would ask. That's right. God wouldn't ask you to pay something that you don't have. Amen. If, someone, if the city of Fort Smith sent me a water bill for $150,000, <laughs> guess what? I'd be coming to your house to take a shower. You know why? Because I don't have it. God wouldn't ask you to pay something that you don't have. What he's going to ask, you have. And he's giving you the ability to pay it. 
It's going to cost you. Here's what it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you your time. It's going to cost you your time. Everybody has time, right? How many hours in a day do you have? 24. You know, some people say, I need to make time. How many of you guys have ever said you need to make time? I've, I've said it. I need to make time to do this. Well, really, we can't make any more time. We got to take time. There's only 24 hours in a day that God has given us. We need to take some time. It's going to cost you your time. How many of you know your time is valuable? I hope you guys sometimes feel like you're already running with a chicken with his head cut off. <laughs> now, see, people say that, but I've never really seen a chicken with its head cut off before. Some of you guys have. <laughs> well, listen. M- make sure you don't start cutting no chickens' heads off in front of me. It's going to cost you your time. But you know what? Sometimes we just feel like we're all over the place and we hardly have time for nothing. I just believe that we get a chance to do about whatever we want to do. Really quiet. Here's something else that's going to cost you and me. It's going to cost you some dedication. I ask all of my, my uh, class, I teach a class in our church called The House 411. It's basically a very informal class, talks about what the house is about, what our vision is about, what we believe, and so on and so forth. And in that class, I ask the question, Can you be committed to something but not dedicated to it? Now, if you've been in that class, don't don't respond. But can you be committed to something but not dedicated to it? I heard somebody say yes, and you've been in my class, and you heard the answer. And you said yes real loud. You can be committed to something but not dedicated to it. Just because you commit to something doesn't mean you're going to de- be dedicated to it. I can commit to picking you up every Sunday morning at 9.15. But that don't mean I'll do it every Sunday. So God wants us to be dedicated about this situation. He's going to want us to invest our time, but we also need to be dedicated. So it's going to cost your dedication. Here's the third thing it's going to cost. It's going to take you prioritizing. It's going to take you putting this place in its proper place. There's a place for everything, right? It's going to cost you prioritizing. And I've I've been guilty of having stuff out of a whack. Anybody else been guilty of that? And you got to go back in and, and, and clean up some stuff, readjust some stuff. Adjustments are good in your life. Otherwise, we become too complacent. This biblical principle that will transform your life, ministry, church, and city was also a major factor in the success of the lives of Jesus, his disciples, the mother church in Jerusalem, one of my favorite preachers of all times, Dr. Billy Graham, and any other significant preacher or ministry as of today. Jesus possessed this thing that I'm talking about. His disciples possessed it. The mother church in Jerusalem that was absolutely, incredibly on fire for God possessed it. Dr. Billy Graham possessed it. And any other preacher or pastor or ministry that you can think of today that's doing anything significant in the kingdom of God, they also, or it also, possesses it. I wonder what that is. This biblical principle that I'm referring to is none other than Prayer. Prayer. Did you know that prayer is the single most important thing that you and I can do as a Christian? Prayer. Prayer is more important than you studying the Bible. I am not saying don't study the Bible because you should study the Bible. Prayer is more important than your attendance on a Sunday or a Wednesday night. And you definitely know I'm not telling you don't stay at home on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night. But more important than your attendance is your prayer life. More important than your tithing offering is your prayer life. 
more important than anything that you do is your prayer life. If you desire to step out of the ordinary and into the extraordinary, spend some quality time in the presence of God in prayer. The same can be said about our church in corporate prayer. If you want to step out of the mm, and into the wow, come before God with prayer. And I promise you, your life will be changed from the inside out. You begin to walk in the, in the miraculous. You begin to see things and hear things from God like you've never heard before. If you desire to step out of the ordinary and into the extraordinary, spend some quality time in the presence of God in prayer. The same can be said about our church in corporate prayer. Here's some examples. Jesus, or before Jesus started his earthly ministry, before he ever started his earthly ministry, Jesus went out into the wilderness. Well, let me back up. You guys remember the story? John the Baptist, <clears throat> excuse me, was at the River Jordan baptizing people. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a lot of people hadn't even seen Jesus at that point in time. What did John say? Hold up, y'all. Behold, the Lamb of God. Jesus was walking. Can you picture Jesus walking up at a, at a baptism? And a lot of these people hadn't even see, seen him yet. But in the midst of John the Baptist baptizing, he stopped and said, hey, everybody, look. Behold, there he is. That's the, there's my cousin. Did you guys know that Jesus and John the Baptist were cousins? Jesus was six months older than Jesus. Uh, Jesus was six months younger. I'll get it right. Jesus was six months younger than John the Baptist. So, so John the Baptist was the cousin of Jesus. He said, hold up, look. There's the man that we've been talking about all this time. There's the man that you've been reading about in the scrolls all this time. There's the man that will take away the sins of the world. There he is, y'all. After Jesus was baptized, the Bible says that the Spirit of God, like as of a dove, lit upon his head. And Jesus, in that moment, was filled with with the Holy Ghost. Now, from that moment, Jesus went out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. How many of you know you don't have to go in no wilderness to be tempted by the devil? How many of you know that we are in the wilderness right now? So we better be praying right now. Listen to this. Matthew chapter 4, let's start verse number 1 and 2. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, and when he had fasted, Forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. Now, you don't see the word prayer in there, do you? The Bible says that he had fast, and when he had fast, forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. The word prayer isn't in there. But how many of you know he didn't just go out there and just fast? By the way, how many of you have prayed, but didn't, I mean, you fast, but you didn't pray? Prayer and fasting goes together, right? That's like... You, you don't make just a peanut butter sandwich, do you? Peanut butter and jelly, it just goes together. Now, some of y'all might, but don't give me just the old thick peanut butter sandwich to, to stick to the roof of my mouth. Put some jelly on that thing and a cold glass of milk. Prayer and fasting goes to, well, my whole point is, even though the Bible says that he fasts, Jesus prayed and he fasted. Now, if Jesus prayed and he was the Son of God, how many of you know that we better be praying because we are children of God? And if Jesus prayed, we show sure enough need to be praying. Somebody say amen. amen. The Bible says, and this is not in, 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 on the screen, the Bible says, in a great while before day, Jesus departed and went into a solitary place and there prayed. He got away from everybody. He got away from the 12 disciples. 
because he knew that he needed to be in the presence of Almighty God. How often do you get in the presence of God? Uninterrupted time with God. Hey, I'm not the pastor, so I don't have to pray like that. You may not be the pastor, but you need to pray like that. The devil just don't just want the pastor. The devil wants you. If you're a child of God, you're an enemy of the enemy. And he has come to steal, kill, and destroy. I used to hear the old saints of God say, we better be prayed up. What does prayed up mean? You need to be prayed up. That's what it means. The Bible says that we're to pray without ceasing. Well, what does that mean, pray without ceasing? Does that mean you don't go to sleep at night because you're praying all night? Does that mean that you don't eat because you're... No, that means to stay in the atmosphere of prayer. Well, Pastor, I prayed last week. Pray this week. Pastor, I prayed yesterday. Pray today. Don't stop praying. Pastor, I'm not a very good prayer. Who says you're not a very good prayer? Sounds like a lot of me. Sounds like the devil told you that. See, God is not concerned about how eloquent. Have you ever heard an eloquent prayer? And you've thought before, man, I wish I could pray like him. I wish I could pray like her. God is not concerned about the eloquence. Do you know what prayer is? Prayer is communication between you and God. What, 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 Pastor, when I hear people pray, I hear them put the scripture in there and everything. Yes, they even tell the verse. So what? Pastor, when I pray, I get nervous. Pastor, when I pray, my voice trembles. So what? Doesn't matter. You can't impress God with your pretty little prayers. The only people you can impress with your pretty little prayers is people around you. And some of them you can't impress because they know it ain't genuine. See, the Bible says man looks at the outer appearance, but God looks at the heart. So, man, when you're talking to God, you might tremble a little bit. You may stutter a little bit. Or you may repeat the same words over and over again. It really doesn't matter because you're not talking to me. I mean, I can remember back in my early days of, of, of my Christian life, I remember at, being asked to pray out loud in front of people. And I'll tell you, that was one of the most scariest times in my entire life. I was so nervous, and these were family members I grew up with. But I was so nervous that you could actually hear my voice trembling. You could hear it trembling. But then I got to the point towards I said, you know what, I'm not praying to these people. I'm praying to God for these people. And God is not concerned about how pretty it sounds. Are we all clear there? God's not concerned about how pretty it sounds or what scripture you can put it. You don't have to put no scripture in there. You guys remember when Peter was sinking? And he said, Lord, thou art the prince of peace. Exodus chapter 15, verse 45. <laughs> oh, Lord, I'm, I'm sinking right now. Lord, will you? Come down from heaven and thou shalt pick up his child immediately. Habakkuk 48.2. <laughs> no, he said, Lord, save me. Simple prayer, wasn't it? Simple prayer. Simple prayer is what he said. Lord, save me. But he prayed is the key. Somebody said prayer is the key, but faith unlocks the door. Prayer is the key. Prayer is the key in my life. Prayer and the key needs to be prayer needs to be the key in your life. Prayer needs to be the key in the United States of America. Prayer needs to be the key in Washington, D.C. Prayer needs to be key, be the key at the White House. Prayer needs to be the key at your house. Prayer needs to be the key at my house. Prayer needs to be key at this house. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. This is what Dr. Billy Graham said referring to Jesus in prayer. He said when Jesus prayed in public, he was brief. When Jesus prayed with the disciples, he prayed longer. When Jesus prayed alone, 
He prayed all night. Dr. Billy Graham went on to say, God, help us to pray. If we are to survive, we must have spiritual revival. If we are to have spiritual revival, we must have more earnest, effectual praying. Word from a wise man. Word from a man that I believe was in the presence of God on a daily, base, daily basis. Here are the apostles. A lot of times we overlook this scripture right here. Acts 3 and 1, the Bible says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Now, like you, I wasn't there, but I just believe that according to this scripture, there was a certain time of the day that the apostles went to the temple every single day to pray. These men were filled with the Holy Ghost. These men, were they walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, fast with Jesus. They, they, they watched him perform miracles. He gave them authority, but yet they needed to pray every single day. Many times the apostles went with Jesus as they prayed together. But they went to the temple at the hour of prayer. Dr. Billy Graham, story about him. The day before Billy Graham's interview with, in, in 1982 on the Today Show, his director of public relations, Larry Ross, requested a private room for Graham to pray in before the interview. But when Mr. Graham arrived at the studio, his assistant informed Ross that Mr. Graham didn't need the room. He said, Mr. Graham started praying when he got up this morning. He prayed while eating breakfast. He prayed on the way over in the car. And he'll probably be praying all the way through the interview. Prayer is where it's at, my friends. Amen. Somebody say, we need to pray. pray. Here's the house eight-day ch uh, prayer challenge. I put a little something on Facebook for you guys a few days ago just to kind of wet your whistle and provoke your thinking just a little bit. Here's the house eight-day prayer challenge. For eight straight Sundays starting April 2nd through May 21st, I challenge every member of the house to meet, from, to meet here from 9.30 to 10, just 30 minutes, from 9.30 to 10 a.m. to pray as a church family. And if we haven't seen a... And if we haven't seen a greater move of God in our Sunday morning worship services than what we've already seen, been seeing, you no longer have to attend the morning prayer meetings. If we haven't seen a greater move of God than what we've already been seeing, I want to ask you to come back and pray at those meetings. But I'm asking every member of this house, every member, and, and, and those of you that don't show up, you'll never get a phone call from me or a text or an email saying, hey, where you at? Missed you this morning. You'll never get that. I, I'll never make you feel convicted. I'll never make you feel convicted. This is what I want you to do. And I'm asking every member of the house, if you can be here, not if, because you can. I'm asking every member, well, I'm going to say if. Some of you guys may have to work. Not everyone can be here on a Sunday morning. But I'm asking every member. There's power in unity. The Bible says that one believer can send a thousand demons to flight. Two will send 10,000. Now, just imagine this room right here being full of God's people coming together to stand on His Word to pray. To pray for what? To pray for one another. To pray for people that at 1030 that will be walking through these doors that will have all kinds of things going on in their life. To pray for our city. To pray for our nation to pray for our, our president, to pray about whatever it is that needs to be prayed for. I'm just a firm believer that Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, is the same God that will answer our prayers right now. Just maybe that's why the body of Christ isn't as effective as we should be. Because we've left out a key ingredient 
to the Christian life. And that's prayer. And I'll be the first to tell you, it took me a while to align myself with prayer. Now, I prayed every day, just like you pray every day. But I'm talking about that intimate, one-on-one God time, just me and God. No interruptions. God, just me and you. A good friend of mine by the name of Rodney Fast. Rodney, if you're listening, thank you. It's because of you that inspired me to become a man of prayer. I admired and still do admire my good friend, Rodney Fouts, who pastors a wonderful church in Oklahoma City, a mighty man of God, who actually helped us financially when we first started, gave us a few thousand dollars in the very beginning of this ministry. And I've seen God move in many ways in his life. We were going to harvest time, and I can remember Pastor Holden talking about prayer, the power of a prayer life. Pastor Holden, too, was a mighty man of prayer. But, man, I wanted to develop this, what they had. I wanted to walk out of the ordinary and walk into the extraordinary. And prayer, my friends, was the key. But I had two young girls. And how many of you know that two young girls, sometimes two big girls, argue and fight all the time? I was working at Whirlpool at the time. I'll make this story quick. Working at Whirlpool at the time and had to be there at 6 o'clock. I got up every morning at 5 o'clock. Had to be there by 6. My wife was working in Van Buren, so she didn't get off work till 5. So I had to pick the girls up every day from school. I was mama and daddy for a few hours. So the only time that I could pray was going to have to be at night when everybody's asleep or earlier in the morning when everybody's asleep. Because I didn't want the daddy tell her to stop. Leave me alone. Give it back. Stop. She hit me. I didn't want to hear all that while I'm trying to pray. I didn't want to hear the phones ringing while I'm trying to pray. So it was either wait till they go to bed at night or get up early in the morning. I already got up at 5, right? So what do you think I did? Got up at 4. I wanted to pray for an hour every single day. Seven days a week. One hour. So do you think I got up at four and prayed to five, then got dressed, went to work? Or do you think I prayed when everybody went to bed at night? If you think it was at night, let me see your hands. If you think it was at four o'clock, let me see your hand. Man, you guys got some faith in your preacher. (laughs) Four o'clock every morning. If we went out of town, I got up every morning. I don't care if it was spring break. Got up every morning and went into the presence of God. There are moments that I went to work with my eyes just puffy and red from being in the presence of Almighty God. This church was birthed while in prayer with Almighty God. Revelation came through prayer while in the presence of Almighty God. What am I trying to say? If you want to walk side by side with God, dedicate some time in prayer every day. Don't have to be an hour. Don't have to be 30 minutes. Start with five. If you haven't been doing it, start with five. Start with 10. Start with 20. Start. Just start. Just start. Start somewhere. Quality time Well, Pastor, five minutes ain't quality time in the presence of God. It is if you ain't doing it. See, an hour for somebody is just as great for somebody else that does 30 minutes. 30 minutes is great for somebody else that just does it for 10 minutes that hadn't been doing it. And let me me, me help you out not to do what I first started doing. When I first started, I talked the entire hour. The entire hour, I was saying, God, I want you to do this, and God, I want you to do that, and God this, and God that. And God, 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 what do you want me to do about this? And I never stopped to let God answer back to me. While you're praying, you don't have to talk the whole time. Matter of fact, just pray and hush. You Use some of that hour or use some of that time, period, 
just be quiet. Just peace, be still, and let God speak to your heart. Let God minister to your heart. During that time, sing to God. How many of you guys like to sing to God? Sing to God. Start out thanking God for who He is and what He's done. Start out bragging on God. I love to brag on God. I think when I brag on God, He just smiles real big. This is your time, just you and God. God's not looking for eloquent prayers. He's looking for obedient people. And I promise you, your life will change. Here's the challenge. For eight straight Sundays, starting April 2nd through May 21st, I challenge every member of the house to meet here from 9.30 to 10 a.m. If you can't get here at 9.30, get here when you can, within that time period. We're going to pray as a church family. If you haven't seen a greater move of God, I hope you guys have seen some great moves of God in this building. You know God can do greater than that. Yeah. And God wants to do greater than that. If you hadn't seen a greater move of God in, in, in our Sunday morning worship services than what we've already been seeing, you no longer have to come back. Now, after that eight weeks is over, we're not going to stop. We're going to keep going. But if you hadn't seen anything, just say, Pastor, I hadn't seen nothing. I ain't coming back. Okay. No hurt feelings. But I believe you're going to see something. I'm going to leave you with these right here. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. This is on the day of Pentecost. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, somebody say, and suddenly. Listen, the 120 were in the upper room. The apostles had just came back and went upstairs in the upper room. The mother of Jesus was also in this room. They were up there. What do you think they were doing? They were in the upper room. Jesus had just been crucified. Now they're in the upper room praying, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Here's another story. Acts 4, verse 31. Let me kind of speed you up to part. The apostles were out preaching the gospel. The high priest and other crooks took them to the side and said, do not preach the name of Jesus any longer. The next day they were released and they went back to the group where they were. And the Bible didn't say where they were, they were at. But they went back to this group of people and told them about what took place. Listen to this. Acts 4.31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the Word of God with boldness. See, it's not just about the fact that they were filled with the Holy Ghost. The deal is they got together and they prayed. And as a result, heaven opened up and showered them with power. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. I conclude with this. Faithfully attending church, serving and giving are all biblical and biblical and biblical attributes of dedicated Christians. But nothing moves heaven quite like prayer. If you're a faithful tither, praise God. If you're faithful in your attendance, praise God. But there's something to be said about the power of prayer. In fact, let's do that right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the Word of God that has come forth. I thank you for the people of God that are in this room. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for the faithfulness of this congregation. Lord, I thank you for choosing us to be a leader within our community. And Lord, it's going to take more than just myself. Lord, I'm, I'm unable to get it done alone. 
But I believe, Heavenly Father, that if we all come together and seek your face, at the same time, we can make it happen. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be able to make prayer our number one priority. Lord, help the people of God find some time in their day. Take the time in their day. Set aside some time every single day, even if it's just 10 minutes, to pray and seek your face. Lord, the power of God will rule in their lives like never before. And Father, I just pray on a corporate level that we as the body of Christ, we as the house of restoration, on Sunday mornings at 9.30, Father, that we'll come to this place crying out to you for the lives of the people in our city to be changed. Not only our city, but the people in our, in our families, oh God, our co-workers in different situations. Lord, prayer makes all the difference in the world. Lord, stir something up on the inside of us. Lord, may we all accept this challenge and be dedicated to it. With every head still, every head still bowed and every eye closed and nobody looking around.